Hi, everyone. Welcome to The Parenting Show. I'm Jennifer Anderson. Uh, we are so thrilled to be back here uh, at Rogers TV bringing uh, The Parenting Show. Joining me, uh, of course, is uh, Allison Schaefer, who is a family counselor and my co-host, and we are thrilled to be back here. Yay! This Yay. is the re It's great. <laughs> this is a great reunion. I'm yeah. so thankful for Rogers and for community television and really where I got my start. And we've had such a flood of people emailing saying, I can't wait, you're back. I watched you all the time when I was on mat leave. And of course, now their kids are how many years older? How long ago? Well, so that's the thing because we talked, uh, we started the show 11 years ago. Um, the show itself started 12 years ago. Uh, I wasn't your co-host, so we're not going to talk about that year. Yeah. <laughs> that's the lost Just, year. Right. <laughs> And then, uh, so we started 12 years ago, wow. and or 11 with uh, you and I, and six years the show ran. So it's amazing to be back, but, you know, all of those kids that were babies at the time are now teenagers. Yeah, those people, they don't care about potty training anymore. They want to know about vaping, right? Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, and now there's new people that have kids, and they're still looking for good information. And have no idea what the parenting show is about. So what what is this show? What is the parenting show? So the, the parenting show is an opportunity for parents to have access to an expert, to ask your parenting questions. Now, back on the old show, we were in a different uh, studio, so we had the ability to take calls. This studio, we're asking people to write in with their questions, any parenting question. And uh, so it's a format where I'll be able to give some theory pieces, some practical advice and tips that you can use right away. And generally, the idea is that we need to support one another, that I'm a big believer in parent education, mm -hmm. um, and that if we all hear each other's stories and hear each other's questions, we're much more likely to realize it's not just me, it's not just my kid. You know, we're all in this together to be non judgmental and to be a supportive as possible. Well, and that really was what it was all about because, you know, as you're raising toddlers and you feel alone, you're at home, you're, you know, you don't necessarily know who to turn to, uh, this was a valuable source and you are a valuable source of information to let people know that they aren't alone. And I bring a different perspective, I have to say, and I know that's frustrating for parents because they don't like it when the experts don't agree, you know, because mm -hmm. they, ah, how am I supposed to do it? One person says this, another person says that. The paradigm from which I have worked and trained and raised, I'm actually third generation in my family, is based on Adlerian psychology. And I know a lot of people don't know the name Adler, mm -hmm. um, but in terms of styles of parenting, it would be called the democratic style of parenting, okay. which distinguishes it from either autocratic, where, you know, that ruling with the iron fist or permissive, which I think we've seen a lot of in, in modern day. Um, the reason being, I think a lot of us were raised with very strict parents mm -hmm. and we kind of made a pact to ourselves. I didn't like it. I didn't like being yelled at. My mom would run after me with a wooden spoon or give me the cold shoulder. And, you know, I decided that I'm not going to be that kind of parent. And unfortunately, in the absence of knowing what else to do, we've had a lot of parents who really don't step up in discipline at all. Right. And, and so then the kids end up ruling the roost right. and I don't want the antidote to that to be people saying see let's go back to the old way that in fact there is a third option mm -hmm. and so that's why today's show is really for those people that are just joining us for the first time that are probably just getting into discipline issues with their toddlers or their preschoolers that are looking for some kind of um, understanding of what is discipline if we're not going to do punishment Mm -hmm. And yet we don't want our kids, today's kids are very willful, very strong. We don't want them being rude and entitled either. So uh, what is that sweet spot? What does that Adlerian democratic way really look like? And I want to focus on that uh, today. So uh, eight episodes we are running through. So while we are talking about discipline today, uh, you know, every, every show is going to be different. The topics are going to be different. And we are covering different ages, which is something that we didn't do the first time around. It was kind of zero to 12. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where now uh, we've expanded into those uh, teenage years. Well, you know, and, just, I, uh, and yeah, I rolled my <laughs> eyes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, because when we did the show originally, well, you had little newbie twins, yeah. and I kept saying, why are you calling me the expert? You've got twins. Like, you know, yeah. save me. Uh, but at that time, my kids were, were just in high school, and so now I've been through that full arc of raising my own kids. Obviously, I'm trained in this, but it's another thing to live it experientially right. as a parent. You know, live through a divorce, live through putting them through high school and university. Now both my kids are 
launched and back at home happily. <laughs> They're about <laughs> to launch again. Um, but so I've kind of been through that full cycle of time, and a lot of the people that would have been following would have kids now that are in the um, adolescent years. And adolescence is different, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of what has happened. The cultural backdrop of parenting and, and adolescence is different than it was 10 years ago. We didn't have, you know, world of, um, oh, come on. World of, <laughs> world of, uh, the, the, the biggest, this is what happens in 10 years is that you <laughs> end up going into middle age and losing your mind. Uh, World of Warcraft. I was trying Warcraft. to think of the, the, the yeah. I was thinking like n there was Nightcraft and Minecraft no, Fortnite. and War it's, Fortnite. Fortnite's <laughs> the big, I know I'm getting them all tangled in my head, but the, these you things You were didn't, playing it all night, Snapchat, weren't you? <laughs> yeah, Snapchat didn't exist back yeah. when we had the show on yeah. before. Instagram did, you know, so we, these are new issues. These are current issues. And so I think the, um, the conversations and the questions and the concerns of change too. Right. So we're talking about discipline today. To yeah. me, uh, discipline has always sounded like a heavy negative word. Yeah. And I think for a lot of people, they feel the same way. Yeah, actually, I hate the word myself. It's, um, I mean, it comes from the root disciple to teach. And that part I like because it is about teaching, educating our kids. But I think maybe more accurately and so as to not confuse it with some other styles of, of uh, is, is child guidance. Right. That, uh, that we as parents are tasked with socializing our children so that they can be, and this is the paradox, fulfill themselves as their authentic potential person, unique human that they're going to be, but at the same time learning to adapt and conform so that they can find their sense of belonging and fit in to their social world. Right. Because you are not doing your kid any favors if you don't teach them how to use table manners and sit at the table. Because they're going to end up going to a restaurant and disturbing. They're going to end up being in a classroom and they're not going to know how to wait to, to be the line leader or to sit quietly until the teacher calls upon their hand. You're not helping them. You're, going to, you're actually creating problems for them if you don't socialize them. We all want to feel like we belong. We all want to know the rules so that we can apply the rules and be socially successful. Mm -hmm. And that training, that child guidance begins at home. So... Um, and it starts early, much earlier than, than parents think. And I, I usually say, like, by the, the, when you really want to start thinking about discipline and taking a parenting class is probably around the time that you have that first moment where you say, you're doing that on purpose, aren't you? Because <laughs> up until then, there's a lot of stuff that really is developmental. You know, they, they cry or they're colicky or they're hungry or they're tired or whatever, and so, so we sue them. But at a certain point, you go, you were just crying to get your way. Mm -hmm. And you will know, like, trust yourself to know when you're at that stage. And then it's time to start looking at exactly how we need to react and respond and guide our children. But does that, that's a, a snowball effect, mm -hmm. right? Because it could start, you know, very early on with even sleeping and crying until somebody goes in to pick up a baby turns into a snowball effect of uh, crying at certain times, yeah. tantrums, uh, not listening to no. Mm -hmm. So to your point, like, you know, children learn from the minute they're born. Okay. They're, they're always learning. They're always trying to figure out who am I, what is this world, how do I find my way, how, how do I find my significance, how do I make sense of it? And so they experiment with behaviors, mm -hmm. and then they watch for the social response to that behavior. And so, of course, you're going to learn that one way to beckon a parent is to cry because it's their experience. You cry, they come, and you should. If mm -hmm. a child comes, you, 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 know, you, you should go and sue them. That's absolutely your job. Um, but then they start to learn the secondary game. Maybe I'll just cry when really I should should be sleeping or maybe I'll just cry when I want that cookie because that'll bring them hither forth. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so so now we want to say what is the child trying to accomplish and how can we help them accomplish it in constructive ways as opposed to misbehaving ways. Um, and so the techniques that we use avoid using punishment and rewards because punishment and rewards are what we would categorize as being external control styles of parenting or in a sense are manipulative right you're you're trying to force the child to to mind your will and be obedient and i and i get that a lot of parents are kind of like yep that's right <laughs> that's, what, that's what i want but there's a real downside to obedient kids in that they do not learn to think for themselves and that they are likely to just listen to the influence of other people which means when you are not their influence they're going to listen to the influence of their peer group. They're mm -hmm. going to listen to the influence of a sexual predator who says, you know, come on, you know, get in the car and it's our little secret and don't tell mommy. Um, they're going to uh, listen to the influence of a, of, a, of a worker and not fully 
actualize themselves. So there's a real cost that comes to obedience. And instead, the model of the democratic approach and the Adlerian approach aims to have cooperative children, which is very different. It means they're well-behaved, okay. but they're not doing it out of fear. They're not doing it because they're going to get something for it. They're doing it because it genuinely needs to be done. It's very authentic. It's an intrinsic motivation instead. So what's an example of both of these, if you can put it into real time? If it's, um, you know, with obedience, uh, is it uh, do as I say, sit at the table, you will finish your meal? Absolutely. You know, and if you don't finish your meal, then you don't get iPad. You got to know the, the other thing about technology is because kids love tech so much and, right. and teens like their cell phones so much. This is the number one punitive tactic right now is to take away technology. Right. Uh, and so we just use that as a constant threat. Do this or I'll take away your, your phone. Do this or I'll take away your phone. You're being rude. I'm taking away your phone. And what I remember is uh, you always saying that the punishment that has nothing to do with sitting and eating dinner. Right. So, so exactly. Right? So to your point, so I don't want to punish them by saying no stories tonight or whatever it might be. Um, but neither do I want to say, if you eat everything, I'll let you stay up late. Or if you eat everything, I'll let you have um, two stories at tuck-ins. Both of those are, are manipulations. So instead, those are examples mm -hmm. of punishment and rewards. Instead, we talk about in, in democratic parenting about having children experience consequences. Natural, okay. uh, natural consequences mm -hmm. or logical consequences. So a natural consequence, which is just the outcome, which is I can't control you. I don't know if you're going to eat or not eat. But if you choose for yourself to not eat, the natural consequence is when dinner's done, you didn't eat. You're hungry. Mm -hmm. Yuck. And, you know, you can be empathetic. You can just be like, oh, you got down from the table and you didn't get enough in your belly and now it's time to go to bed and you really want some more food. Oh, that's tough. That's really tough. You don't have to say, well, if you would have stayed at the table. <laughs> you don't have to stick it to them. That's not the way we need to teach the lesson. The lesson is experiencing the outcomes of the choices. And so we can just gently be compassionate and say, maybe next time you'll choose differently. Mm -hmm. and, and that's it. But we don't circle back and say, I better give them an apple. They didn't eat dinner, right? right? Um, so, so that would be an example of a natural consequence. And, and logical consequences are, are the same in that you're asking the child to experience the outcome of a choice they're making. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you have to construct them because they don't happen naturally. They're, they're things that have to be, you know, so a, a good example would be for a toddler. If you'd like to play with the, the markers, you need to keep them on the paper. If we have trouble with the markers staying on the paper and they get on the table or the wall, then we'll need to put the markers away and we'll try again tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So use them properly, keep the markers. Use the mar markers improperly, lose privileges to markers. Okay, but use the markers improperly, crying yeah. when the markers are taken away, and that's where sometimes uh, parents have issues. So, very good point. I think, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I've been Ta there. Yes, yeah. Um, one hmm. of the reasons why parents don't want to implement consequences is because they don't want the fallout that happens after them. There's mm -hmm. not always going to be a fallout. There's always sort of like that the, we say the take time for training. There's mm -hmm. the training period. And once the kid understands that's the, the, the social order, that's the law of the land, then they stop protesting to test to test you. So they won't cry every time. But if you are a parent and you have trouble with strong emotions, you have to ask yourself, what is the story that you're telling yourself about that child's tears? If you're telling yourself the story, my child is emotionally distraught and I am now ruining the primary attachment and they are going to be psychologically damaged and I better start putting money in a bank account because I'm messing up my kid, of course you're going to cave and give them the markers because in your belief system, you think you're damaging them. Mm -hmm. So part of what I need to do is to help educate parents around the fact that there could be a different story behind those tears, that they could be disappointed, they could be sad, they could be frustrated, and that those emotions are not bad things for kids to experience. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I poke a little fun and say, well, if your child cried because you wouldn't give them candy floss for breakfast, would you cave and say, oh, I don't want to damage them. I better give them candy floss. Most responsible parents would say, that's not a choice. And it's, it, I know that to be a good parent, I have to give them a nutritious breakfast. I, why would I give them candy floss? So if you can tolerate those tears... The other tears are, are quite the same thing. It's okay that they're disappointed. It's okay that they're frustrated. In fact, it builds up their frustration tolerance. Mm -hmm. it, it allows them to develop emotional resiliency, which we know is actually a very good 
um, protective mechanism that, to take them into adulthood because life is going to be disappointing. Mm -hmm. And you need to know that you can you know, brush yourself off, pick yourself up, and this too shall pass. And the only way to teach that is experientially. There is not a ribbon for everything. There is not a <laughs> ribbon for everything. No, yes. no. Okay, I want to talk about the tears because uh, we had a question come in to you. Okay. Um, it was, uh, my son started preschool this year and he's still bawling at drop-off. What should I do to help him transition? Yeah. Which I think for a lot of, a lot of parents, this is a hard hard transition as mm -hmm. the kids head into school. Mm -hmm. Um, and of course you worry because you think, boy, it should have settled down by now. But some kids just take longer to settle in. What, what I would say, and I, I, I say this not only as a, you know, a family counselor, but also because I was a nursery school teacher. So I mm -hmm. know what happens on the other side of that door. And in all my years of working with kids in the preschool room, I really only had one child that took an, exor an extra long time to really settle into the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, that was pretty exceptional, and we were in constant contact with the mom, and it did finally settle down. But what truly happens is the tears are for the mother saying goodbye, and Trained teachers know how to get that child into the classroom distracted and busy on a task, and the tears dry up pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is, when it's go home time, the minute the first parent comes to pick up the first kid, the kids know that it's time to go home, they all start crying again. So in the parent's <laughs> mind, I drop them off crying, I pick them up crying, they must have cried the whole morning, <laughs> how am I torturing my kid? And it's really not the case. So to, to, to reduce the emotionality, we recommend a happy, snappy goodbye. So instead of drawing out the transition, which is, it's like, it's like peeling a Band-Aid off one hair at a time. It's way more painful. It's better to have a happy, snappy goodbye and to show the child not pity, but faith and faith in the teacher. So you might have to ask, you know what, we're having a little hard difficulty saying goodbye. You know, if you could help Jason get into the classroom, that would be fine. And they literally might have to take their hands and Pull them off your pant leg. But you say it with a smile. Okay, you'll have a great time. I know you'll manage. And and then whisk yourself away as, as quick. cry all the way home. And, yeah, because <laughs> to, to your point, honestly, they, they, they really, it is hard to say goodbye, but they just don't have the capacity to have a forward orientation to remember what's exciting and happening next. You know, they live in the moment. They live mm -hmm. in the moment. So we can make that moment shorter and, and the emotionality shorter by making it faster. And I think that would, uh, there's kind of this uh, rolling emotion as kids go through school, right? You, you end up being off for the Christmas break, you come back in January, now it's starting over again. So it's being that consistent uh, throughout the year. Yeah, and kids should love going to school because it's a social experience for them. And stay in contact with the teacher and ask how they're doing in the classroom. If you've, there's a difference between saying, I don't want to go to school, which really doesn't mean I don't want to go to school. What it really mm -hmm. means is I'd like to dawdle and have a fight with you right now and I'm just making something up. Mm -hmm. It does not mean that school is not going okay. So right. always check that out with the teacher. And if they're not settling into the classroom, then we've got to do something to help them um, make better friendships, get more embedded in the classroom, and there's things that we can work with the teacher to, to make the kids feel more at home. Right. But even kids that are struggling academically still want to go to school because that's where their pals are. Mm. Uh, if you are at school and you're throwing your toys, that becomes another issue. Uh, we had a question, a three-year-old that throws toys when she's mad, I'm worried she's going to break something, how can I stop her? Mm -hmm. So. It, that is preschool, yeah. but as you head into a nursery school environment, as you head into um, you know, the play park at the mall yeah. or the, the playground, you're going to see that interaction with other kids. I, I think the hard part for parents is that it happens so fast. You don't know it's coming, right? Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and I've seen plenty of fight yeah. amongst parents at play parks. Yeah. Right, because of about, the about interaction. To, yeah, we've, we've got to be, again, to this idea of uh, people disagreeing about how to handle situations. We, we don't have one uh, paradigm anymore, you know? And so, like, it used to be that it wouldn't matter if it was your kid, someone else's kid, mm -hmm. somebody misbehaved, we spanked. You know, but we don't do that anymore. So mm -hmm. now, that he's, so is it a timeout? Do you speak up? What do you, you know? Do I? Do you talk to my kid? There, there's a lot of uh, social worry about about how to conduct things. I would say if it's your child, you're the one who needs to step up. Mm -hmm. um, if somebody else steps up, then make sure that they do it in a respectful way. But a lot of people actually have 
your kids will often listen to anyone other than you. So, mm -hmm. so long as it's respectful, it might be more effective to have somebody else speak up. But in the, in the case of throwing, I would say here's an opportunity for a great logical consequence. So you could say, if you'd like to keep that toy, you need to be safe with it. If you throw that toy, that means you lose the toy privilege. And something gets chucked, I would immediately confiscate it, put it on top of the fridge and say, oh, looks like we're having trouble playing with our truck. You know, we'll try again tomorrow. And it's gone. They chuck two things, take two things away. Three things, take three things away. And at some point say, you know, we need to be safe to be here, can you calm yourself or do we need to, to go? And that might mean leaving the play park, that might mean going to a timeout, going to their bedroom, but the point is you wanna move them away where where it's a safe place. Or, or, or you know, maybe that if you have a f outside where it's okay to throw things. No, we can't throw the truck in the living room, but if you'd like to throw a ball, you can throw a ball out in the backyard. So that would be an example of, of redirection. I think that's a strange thought for, for parents. You're giving your child the choice. As a three-year-old, you're saying, can we stay here or do we need to leave? Mm -hmm. So, again, don't offer a choice that you can't follow through on, mm -hmm. like, right? You, you never want to have a consequence that's like, you know, if you keep doing that, we're not going to Disneyland and you've already paid Ever. for the tickets. And, yeah, <laughs> that's right. You know, you don't ever, throw, because all that will do is your kids, because I said they're always learning. Mm -hmm. They're always learning from what happens. And if what they learn is you just yap and threaten consequences and never really do them, then you undermine your own authority. They basically say, yeah, nah, she doesn't really mean it. She's always saying stuff like that. You've got to follow through on anything. And to your point about choice, the truth is you can't make another person do anything. Sit with that for a minute. Okay. <laughs> you are all, I think part of why parents get so angry themselves is because they feel like they're losing control. Because they feel like their child is, is in, um, eroding their ability to control a certain situation. I'm saying, you can't control your child, but you can't control you. Your child is going to decide for themselves, whether you like it or not. But They decide with behavior. But I have to make a choice for my child if we are going to an appointment right. and they aren't getting their boots on. Right. So we're, so here's where we could say, uh, I, I kind of use the same thing as like, you don't, if, if the house is on fire, mm -hmm. you don't say, well, the house is on fire. Do you think we should leave? Mm -hmm. Right? Like you're like, no. And I would say the same to an appointment. We, we need to leave the house. We need to go to the doctor's appointment. Can you come on your own or do I need to carry you? Mm-hmm. Are you football, going to put your football holes? Yeah, well, and, and to, but to your point, you know, there's a difference then between, and this is where something that is positive discipline and democratic parenting turns into something punitive. Punitive. If you say, "Looks like I looks like I need to carry you," and then you grab them by their wrist or the back of their shirt, you know, you're kind of giving them the what for. It's the same little. We like we keep we have this old history that we think that if we just make them a little uncomfortable, mm -hmm. you know, then then they're going to pay for that bad choice. So it does end up being punitive. It, it doesn't right. need, if you, if you punish, you're being discouraging, you're less likely to get cooperative behavior. So you can still pick them up, but just pick them up as nicely as you can and pick them up with a friendly tone. It's what you're going to do. It's, it doesn't need our, our, right. our, you know, our, our tone, our growling to get them there. Uh, we have about five minutes left, so I just wow. want to get okay. one more, um, one more do, in. Do. I cannot, oh, all right. I cannot stand the whining. <laughs> Make it stop. That never ends, by the way. I, <laughs> That's not a toddler. We're going to talk about that every show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, yeah, it might have a different sound, but it still fall, sort of falls in the category. Um, I don't know anybody who uh, doesn't at some point in their child rearing years have to experience whining. And like nails on a blackboard, it really does drive us crazy. So I've given parents over the years a bunch of different advice about this, and, and, and from Adlerian psychology, and I think it's important, especially since this episode is about that beginning discipline piece, is again going back to why kids do what they do. We always have to ask, what's the child's goal? What are they trying to accomplish? And under the age of 10, there's only four reasons for kids' misbehavior. Okay. It's either undue attention seeking, a power, power struggle, to revenge upon you, or some form of avoidance. And every parent that's working with toddlers is going to have attention-seeking and power struggles, not so much the, the revenge and, and the other ones That's as they get a bit older. And so a lot of whining is about undue attention-seeking because we end up saying, don't do that. Use your regular voice. We, we, we do a lot of kind of nagging, reminding. It engages us in conversation. So one thing you can do is ignore it. 
Uh, and that can look a couple of ways. And I, don't ignore the child, just ignore the tone. Mm -hmm. So don't let it bother you, basically. Or you can say, I only respond to regular voices. And you don't have to remind them that each time. You can just, so that they go, I want a juice. Do I get a, a word for that? Yeah, I, yeah, you've heard that. that. <laughs> uh, yes, Allison playing the role of a two-and-a-half-year-old. Um, so if they want, you, they might just say, juice, juice, can I have a juice? Juice. And until I wait until they actually ex pull it together to actually get it out without the wine, say, oh, sounds like you'd like to have a juice. So I just teach them through non-responsiveness until they get the tone right. So you could try that as well. But having done this for years and years and years and given those two same pieces of advice, the one that actually, the third piece of advice which tends to really work the best is that because undue attention seeking is a misguided way, mistaken approach at trying to get connection, just show them connection in a constructive way, which means take a moment and have a cuddle. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you get down to their, to their level or have them crawl on, 10 seconds, 30 seconds of cuddle time, rocking time, love you, love you, love you. Then they get reconnected, they, they feel that closeness and they stop needing to irritate you mm -hmm. in order to get engagement because you're offering up engagement in a constructive way. So try some cuddle, extra cuddle time with that whiny kid and see if it stops. I, that's my favorite line. Even, you know, the kids are 13 now and it's, do you need a hug? Yeah. Do you need, <laughs> that's, if I don't know how to answer, to begin with, yeah. Just, do you need a hug from and, your mommy? I normally, I, and they yeah, go, mom. <laughs> you can just. The, yeah. There's some kids are not touchy, but nonetheless, it's yeah. still nice to like to. Be, I'd rather have a, a child decline my offer to hug them than to say my mom never hugged me. Right? Yeah. I'm constantly trying to hug my kids. You mm -hmm. know, so I can I can lay off. I'll, I'll respect boundaries, but yeah. I want them to know I'm always going in for the love. Uh, we have a minute left. I want. To, we've kind of skimmed on so many uh, different Big topics. Topic, yeah. You have three books that talk about these topics in addition to a great resource on your website. So let's start with the books mm -hmm. very quickly. Right. Um, they're up on the screen now. Yep. And all of them have uh, valuable information. Absolutely. So, uh, and so the Breaking the Good Mom Myth is more about our parenting background. Honey, I Wreck the Kids is more about the discipline. But the resource page has books outside of mine from other authors, but they're all based on the same philosophy or uh, companion uh, philosophies around raising kids. Amazing. It's been so nice sitting on this couch so with you. So great to be back with you, too. <laughs> Looking forward to the other episodes. All right. Um, that's, that's it for this edition of The Parenting Show. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, we hope it's been a valuable resource for you, and uh, um, we'll see you next time. Happy parenting. Happy parenting. <laughs> <laughs>